Please welcome Amelia Barilli. Thank you so much for coming today to this presentation and joining with us in the celebrations for homecoming. So let's start by talking a little bit about neuroplasticity. How many of you uh, have read or are interested in it? Okay, great. And I'm sure you have perhaps your own definitions of neuroplasticity. I'm going to use a very simple one, uh, which is that the experience that we have changes the function of the brain. Neuroplasticity, to me, uh, the way I uh, research it and uh, practice it with my students, etc., is um, it's more about understanding the whole process of cognition. And the process of cognition, as we know, involves also the process of experience. So um, we learn more when our mind, when our brain and our heart, let's keep talking about the physical structure, when our brain and our heart are uh, attuned. Students uh, every year come uh, on the one hand more aware, uh, more technology savvy, you know, they are ready to, as we are giving the lecture, perhaps find five other sources that perhaps know more than us about whatever we are teaching them. So, I mean, they are very savvy, they, they, they really want to learn, they have this explosion of information and they need to sort through it what is really of meaning to them and to their communities. And they also can be very concerned about uh, the world they are going to go, you know, where, uh, if there is going to be work, if there is, what can they do there, if they, if they are empowered at all to make any kind of difference. So I've seen the, the state of my students as every year, I see them more concerned and more um, aware, but also in, in a way more vulnerable. Um, I started doing a little bit of meditation with them uh, under the table <laughs> uh, before they would do presentations, for example, for the class, or teach them simple practices, a few minutes, so that they could do it before taking exams, or that they could do it before sitting to write a paper, you know, to calm their mind a little bit and allow their creativity to come up. And as I continue to do my research with the BLC on how to foster creative thinking, I thought, well, what we need to do is to bring all this understanding that the mind is not a thing but a process and that we learn best when the mind and the, when the brain and the heart are attuned and that we learn best not only when uh, we are getting information but when we are reflecting about the process of learning. So I thought, well, I will create some courses where I can, in fact, apply this. And uh, one of the courses is for the undergraduates, and the other course I have taught to the undergraduates, and then I taught it in Oli, which is really a very wonderful place. I highly recommend uh, the experience of Oli because there is so much joy of learning and the freedom is just coming and, and learning. There is no grading. There is, it's, just, it's just an ideal situation. So one of the courses was for the undergraduates, the other is um, taught for the undergraduates, but then I took it to Oli, and from there, other courses sprang. Uh, the one for the undergraduates is based on service learning. Have you, some of you heard of service learning? Okay, a few of you, okay, great. So service learning is not just service in the community, and it's not just learning in the classroom. What we do is we design the courses so that the content that is taught in the classroom, the, the particular text, are going to illuminate the experience that the students have serving in the community. And then the service in the community is going to illuminate the text. For example, in my 102A, a Spanish grammar and composition, advanced grammar and composition, so my st the students that come to me are the ones that are more advanced in Spanish. We are reading Pablo Neruda, right? His poetry about El Pueblo or we are reading Garcia Marquez, the, the speech that he gave when he accepted the Nobel Prize, which is a speech called La Soledad de America Latina, uh, and it's about alienation and solidarity and how you know, uh, the Western world can help Latin America most if it changes the way it looks at it 
and respects the programs of development that are happening in Latin America. And it talks a lot about solidarity between nations, etc. Then my students read another novel speech, the one that Rigoberta Menchu gave, a Guatemalan indigenous person who got the Nobel Prize. This time the Europeans have heard the uh, appeal that Garcia Marquez had done, and they gave the Nobel Prize to a, an indigenous woman who working with an anthropologist, an educated woman who went and took her story, and they got to know the story, and, and the world supported the plight of the Guatemalans and asked that the massacres there should be stopped. Um, and so my students see how people working together can help to change things. In the case of Rigoberta Menchu, one woman collecting the story of another woman. And I propose to them that they can go and meet some more Guatemalans and help in their Salvadorians, Mexicans, uh, Hondurans, etc., who are in an organization very near the university, just across RSF, Recreation Sports Facility, just this, less than a block away from our classroom. They can go and put an hour a week um, for 10 hours or 12 hours, whatever, and they can use the Spanish to take the political asylum stories of the refugees that are there uh, processing their cases. They can help Latino families uh, by teaching them English. They can work with um, Latino students in bilingual schools like Rosa Parks or Manzanita Seed. And so I arrange with the particular um, organizations and the text that we are reading also about multiculturalism, bilingualism, immigration, and the uh, text in Spanish of all these marvelous authors, so that the students, when they go there, they have a bit more of the context, but then they meet the people, the people that embody that that they are reading. And so their minds and hearts open up in a way that it would be not possible just discussing these things in the classroom. And, and they meet population that perhaps not always they would have met. And they feel in a position of empowerment where they are using whatever they have to help somebody else. And that's something that really just totally engages them with the text and helps them to develop more critical thinking and motivates them to hone their Spanish because they are you know, uh, translating, they are uh, doing research on country conditions, they are taking the stories. So um, I'm going to show you just a little bit, if you could come please, uh, I'm going to show you just a little bit of uh, the director of the, uh, that organization talking about the role of our students and some of the students talking about their experience. And um, yeah. say um, from the Spanish departments is like 60 or 70 a year who come through our program. Now some of them put in um, a few hours a week and others kind of get hooked and come in um, until I have to kick them out. Working here for, for a few years was, was the best practice I ever had. Um, for Spanish, even I think even better practice than, than going and studying abroad, um, just because you had to always make sure that you were using the right words um, and being precise. I wish I could have kept that up in law school. I, I'm losing I'm losing some of the progress I made, but it's been it's been great for my Spanish working here. So is it tiene or todavía no? No, Okay, so tengo una lista de in a very compassionate and wonderful, loving way. Um, our students, students of the classes reach out to everybody, no matter who they are, and um, just learn a whole lot about the human condition. The first person I remember talking to, and I don't remember his name, um, but he was sitting waiting for someone to help him, and I still didn't really know what to do, but I sat down just to talk to him, and he um, told me that he hadn't seen his daughter for 
three years that she had just been born when he left um, to come to the U.S. And that just really um, shocked me, um, trying to imagine what that would be like and um, not having that option to go see her or for the rest of his family to come here. Um, so those were the kind of things that really affected me and got me um, thinking and wanting to understand more about um, more about immigration, more about what the history of um, these countries were that um, people were coming here. My personal experience was, um, it's almost hard to put into words, but I still remember my very first client that I interviewed for an asylum case, um, and he was my age, and just sort of going through his life story compared to mine, I mean, it, it was something, uh, you know, I almost just wanted to like sit down and cry uh, rather than keep going with the interview, but, um, but something that I learned in working with him and in working with all the clients here is just how resilient people are. You know, you would think reading these cases on paper that that the people who coming into the office would, you know, be very fragile. In some ways they are, but in a lot of ways they're sort of the strongest people you'll ever meet. I mean, they've battled through so much adversity and they're at the point now where they're taking their, you know, taking matters into their own hands and, and getting themselves the help they need and, and fighting for the right to stay in this country and so you know realizing just how strong the clients were is something that really for me personally it's 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 hard to put into words how, how meaningful that that experience was but it's something that um, that I, I really cherish. This uh, is in YouTube is under building nurturing communities a Berkeley story um, again, YouTube, Building Nurturing Communities, a, a Berkeley story, and if you would like to circulate it and send it to other people that may think of other new ways of collaborating and bringing, making bridges between um, the community and the classroom so that we use the potential of our students and we also empower them and motivate them to learn more deeply because right now they have so many worries and so many technological distractions that's very important to be able to capture their minds and hearts through service. So I think it's time probably now for questions. Um, yes. Or comments or anything. Yes, do we have the mics? Uh, yes. Okay, great. OLI stands for Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. And if you look at everything we have been talking about here, it's about this process of lifelong learning, which in uh, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute is, uh, many of the people that come to us is 50 and over, uh, 80 and even 90. We have students that are, you know, very advanced in their age and they, want to learn and they have a great time in the classes. We just, uh, it's mainly um, partly talking among themselves, partly discussing these concepts, partly learning new practices, but there are other kinds of courses on um, politics, uh, geography, history, art, opera, other ways of psychology, you know, all so Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. And now is, I think Susan has this new initiative where it's not only going to be 50 and up, but everyone is welcome. And there are some intergenerational courses that she's going to be teaching with uh, the Dean of Public Policy, where some of the graduates from that school are coming to some of the courses. We're teaching for the uh, adult population, older adult. Uh, so it, that's what Osher Lifelong Learning Institute is. And, and then we all have this commitment to lifelong learning, starting also, in my case, with the younger ones, with the undergraduates. Uh, has consciousness been figured out yet? What is consciousness? Okay, great <laughs> question. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> Starting with the beginning of the universe. <laughs> uh, okay, 
I'll tell you my understanding of consciousness. The same that with mind and with brain, whatever, there are all kinds of different approaches to it. My understanding is that we are embodied consciousness and that that journey started with the very beginning. Uh, a little bit of this is because of the Indian tradition that has influenced me so much that talks about two principles, uh, Purusha and Prakriti, the, what would be just pure consciousness, unmanifested consciousness, and something nobody has been able to explain me yet, but I <laughs> somehow it must have happened, that that consciousness that was unmanifested started, in, in India they said it got in the proximity of the eternal principle of matter, and somehow it started manifesting. And so it manifests into ever more complicated forms from the first gases and uh, you know, other forms, the galaxies, and in, in the earth through ever more complicated organisms. And it manifests through our whole body. So for that is that mind, body, and spirit are not separate, but are a continuum of consciousness that it's embodied in our body. And for that, whatever we think, and we know this, whatever we think and whatever we feel, it has an effect in our body, right? I mean, you know what happens when you are in love. You know what happens when you are very angry. <laughs> you just think about your own experience. You will realize that it's not that your mind is somewhere and your body is somewhere else. It's a continuum. And so consciousness is through all of us. I believe that it's also all around us. I believe that it's in the trees in a different form. We evolved a more complicated nervous system so that we are able, capable of self-consciousness. We are able of reflecting. And that's a blessing, you know, that we have self-consciousness, but it's also a curse because we can think about worries tomorrow that we don't even know if they are going to happen tomorrow. But we think and they materialize in our head and affect our whole patterns of thinking and then the next time we'll worry even more. So for that we need to really look at the process of how are, are we um, shaping our experience? How are we using that consciousness? Is it at all possible to work with the body and the mind so that a lot of this other clutter uh, starts settling down, you know, starts in a way dissolving and allows a space for the a greater understanding to emerge. I mean, in all the old traditions, they talk about Buddha nature, consciousness, spirit, whatever is there. We all have it. They say the problem is that there are many veils. So how to remove those veils? How to help to calm down? And then the real knowledge, knowing begins.